Okay. All right. So welcome. Happy mamas and happy minis and the supporting village. And I see you guys are definitely out tonight supporting um, our beautiful mother to be as she uh, continues this journey along um, becoming a happy mama. Yes. I'm Michelle Wilson. I am, and excuse me if I go back and forth because I'm letting people in at the same time. Um, so, sorry. All right, here we go. So I'm Michelle Wilson. I'm the executive director of Happy Mama, Happy Mini, which is a nonprofit, a mental health nonprofit, 501c3 organization. And with Happy Mama, Happy Mini, we promote proactive ways to address your mental health, um, we serve mothers, children um, by providing support and, you know, being a true advocate of mental health because it looks so different for so many different phases and seasons of our lives. Um, and mainly just to make sure that we're really raising happy and healthy children. Um, we offer services that you can find on our website. Um, and I co-founded this organization with my personal little happy mini, Hannah Marie. Um, my journey to motherhood actually led my daughter and I to um, run a mental health nonprofit. Um, but okay, let the person in, sorry. So yeah, so that's enough about me. So now we're going to actually get into what we're doing tonight. And I have some notes because my line name was dissertation. I don't know if I ever shared that with you, but that means I can talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. All right. So tonight we are here on Zoom honoring a very, very dear friend of mine. Um, she actually went to Spelman and I went to Clark Atlanta. She pledged AKA, I pledged Delta. <laughs> Our career paths couldn't have been more different. <laughs> But somehow for 15 years, I did the math for 15 years, you know, we haven't missed a season of each other's life, like in all seasons, you know, it's just, I was like, dang, you know, that's just, that's just real love and like a true sisterhood bond for me. That means a lot to me that life happens and, you know, some of the closest people you're not even out in public with all the time, you know, so um, thank you for being that person for me through my many seasons and sharing your seasons with me too. Um, I love her and I am so happy that she's at a place, you know, to be transparent um, and share her journey to motherhood with you all because as mothers and some people that aren't mothers yet, you know, it's not really easy to do. And I, and I think she'll get into how she finally just kind of got that jump and, and did it. And we're so proud of you for doing that. Um, so welcome to our virtual stage via Zoom. I'm going to ask you um, a couple of questions, probably a lot of questions, about your IVF process. Because together, as we talked about this yesterday, you know, we, we will break the silence of those, you know, infertility conversations and things of that nature and support one another. Because that's what we're supposed to do. Yes. Let in. And so I would love for you to introduce yourself um, and share everyone. We're just going to start from the beginning and actually tell us a little bit about yourself first with just three words. Hmm. Three words. Um, family, God, and love. Oh, that is like perfect for you. <laughs> That is like, oh my God, you're right. So how does your background, including, you know, the three words that you just mentioned, how does your background relate to this journey that you're on? Like, how did you get to the IVF journey? Yeah, so, I mean, I grew up in a pretty big family um, and that was not just immediate family. It was, you know, extended friends, family. My parents moved from Alabama to Maryland and at the time, there were not a lot of black families there. So when they would meet black families, they became our families. Um, so that's the family. It's, you know, not just blood re relatives, but it's extended family. And that's how I've always been raised. I've had aunts, you know, that are like my mom's best friends. I've had family members, you know, who are my family members. And we were raised to see each other all of the time. My cousins and I, we saw each other every summer. So I've always wanted a family of my own. Um, and so, you know, like you grow up, you know, your parents are advising you to, you know, focus on career, school, get married, 
Um, and, you know, our generation is getting married a lot later now in life. And so the conversations that need to be had before you even get to that point, you know, they get missed. And that's between the age of like 21, I would say, and 30. Those, that's a crucial time to think about your fertility, even if you're not married, even if you're not in a relationship, if you know deep in your soul that you want to be a, a parent one day, um, that's the time to have that conversation. And it's no one's fault. It's just that there's not enough awareness around it. You know, um, preserving your fertility when you're younger can help you to focus on, um, you know, your career, you know, if you want to be married or if you want to, whatever you want to achieve, if you want to travel, some people don't want to be parents, but sometimes we wait until it's almost too late to think about it, thinking that it's going to be easy. And it's just not, you know, it's not easy for everyone. So that's kind of how I got here. And at what point did you realize it did not become easy for you? Well, my, so my OBGYN, I had a really good OBGYN. Everybody doesn't have this experience. He was always very good about asking me like, what are your plans for motherhood? Because I'm either going to advise you to get on birth control or I'm going to advise you to try. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, you know, I would always kind of like push him off. Like, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. I'm not there. You know, I don't have anyone in my life that I'd want to have a child with right now or whatever. Um, and so we didn't have a conversation about egg, egg freezing until I was probably like 36, okay. at which he told me that I was like probably too old, which is not true. Not true. Um, for egg freezing, for egg freezing, okay. you might not get as many eggs, but just think about it. I'm 42. Now my 36 year old eggs would be a much better, would be, would be great to have those right now than my 42 year old eggs. Um, and one thing I would like to note is that your fertility drastically changes once you hit like 35, you know, there are people who are a lot younger than that, who have a lot of fertility challenges. Some of the people I've met are in their twenties, um, and have been diagnosed with diminished ovarian reserve at like 25. So they knew from that age that they would probably have to pursue in vitro fertilization or um, donor eggs, which is mind blowing to me because that's nothing that we're thinking about at 25 at homecoming, <laughs> you know? Uh, right, especially in the AUC. Yes, nobody's thinking about that. We're thinking no, opposite. The opposite, <laughs> like you're trying to prevent it, you know? Um, right. There's so many more steps in between that you, you should consider. Um, and the only way that we're going to be able to help with that is by talking about it. It's awareness. You know, I went to a reunion with my line sisters, like over maybe like a year and a half ago, and probably five of us at the table, five of them at the table had said that they froze their eggs. Nobody ever talks about that when it's happening, you know? Wow. Whereas if those conversations were being had, it's something like, you know, Hey girl, have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? That is an important question to have, you know, if, but if you don't have the knowledge or if you don't know about it, because I didn't know about it and it is very expensive, you know, nobody's talking about it, but you know, what I found is if you want something, you can find a way there are resources, there are other places that offer things for like, you know, a lower cost, but, um, but yeah, so yeah. So, so 35. That, okay. No, no, go ahead. Well, I was going to say to your point of you didn't, you guys did not realize that you all are line sisters, essentially line sisters are somewhat, you know, close. Um, right. You guys were in this retreat and it's like, oh my God, it's five of us. Like, how did that conversation, like, how did it open so that one person was like, yes, me too, me too. Like, you know. Yeah. So it always starts with men. Are you guys dating? <laughs> are you in a relationship? Are you like, what's going on? It always starts around, you know, everyone taking inventory of, you know, where you're at in your relationship journey, because we were probably third, well, we were probably 40, like about everyone was turning probably 41 at the time when okay. we had that. So, you know, still a good amount of us were unmarried, were not married at the time. Um, and people just kind of like, you know, we always kind of check in with each other, like what's going on with that. And so that led to the conversation of, well, I'm not married, but I want to have kids, you know, but I don't want to settle. So that's kind of how that, how that came up. Good. Okay. So the challenges that um, you started facing with the doctors at first, you mentioned one doctor was like at 35, you were too old. And now here you are at this age, like what are, what are those challenges? Talk a little bit more about those challenges. I think the challenges, it varies 
obviously from woman to woman situation yeah. situation but I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure what you are able to share can you know help yeah. other people yeah um so yeah so at 36 you know my doctor told me that I was you know, probably too old to consider freezing my eggs. And he's like, you just need to try. And I'm like, with who? (laughs) Can you write a prescription for that part too? Because that's the part that I don't have. Um, So fast forward a couple years later, that was kind of the end of that conversation. I didn't look into it any further. Um, So fast forward a couple years later, two years later, I met my husband. You know, we were both 38 when we met. And we were very candid in the beginning with each other about what we wanted for the future. We knew that we both wanted to be married. We knew that we both both wanted to have children. And once we decided to be in a committed relationship, we were open to the possibility of that happening just because of age, you know? Um, and so we actually, um, you know, we dated for, a, for like probably like a year or two years before we were like maybe even trying Um, And it just wasn't happening. And so my doctor, you know, he was like, well, if you've been trying for at least six months, it's time for me to refer you to a reproductive endocrinologist, which is a fertility doctor. Um, And that first experience was awful. It was really bad. Um, So one thing I will say is I feel so bad for people sometimes because they let their first experience, if it's bad, shape the rest of their experience. Um, and it was so bad to where my husband wasn't even really open to it at first because he, the doctor just made us feel like first he didn't have our correct information in front of him. So he was telling me that I had a blocked tube, but I had done all these tests before I'd done blood work. I had done, um, which is called an HSG. It's, um, um, I can't remember what it stands for exactly, but it's basically the type of, um, what they do is they insert like saline into your uterus and your fallopian tubes and make sure that your tubes aren't blocked. Um, and so I had that done, everything was clear. I had gotten the paperwork back from the lab. The tech told me everything was fine. Um, you know, nothing was blocked. So that was clear. And so he told me that I had a blocked tube. And so I was like, are you sure? Because that's not what I was told. And wow. so the whole appointment, I'm over here like barely listening to what he's saying because I'm thinking that I have a blocked tube. Um, and then, you know, just the way he talked, you know, he had no bedside manner, pretty much. He didn't make us feel, you know, there was no compassion in what he was talking about. It's a very vulnerable place you're in when you come for a consult for a consultation. Um, and that's my advice too, is, you know, and my husband says it all the time, have five consultations. Don't just have one because we walked away from that consultation and, you know, neither of us were really open to the, the, the idea of IVF and all that because it was so unpleasant. But, you know, the researcher in me did all this research. I looked up reviews on that doctor and he had horrible reviews from like a lot of other people. Um, and my OBGYN, he, when I told him about the experience, he was like, you know, I was hoping that you got a different doctor, but I don't think she was available that day. So mm-hmm. I would recommend okay. that you go to this other clinic instead. So Um, that's how we ended up first learning about it. And that's when I did my deep dive and my plunge into YouTube, um, to learn more about, you know, in vitro fertilization or IVF. Um, I have family that's gone through it. So I, you know, was able to talk to them, but it's been a while. So, um, yeah, I had to kind of advocate for myself in that sense of you're not going to accept this. You know, I went back and looked at my records and it came back that he was wrong. And I asked, wow. staff, I was like, you guys need to address this because, yeah. you know, like as a woman that can shape your entire feelings of becoming a mother after that. And some people give up, you know, so thank God. We're thinking that doctors know everything when it's, yeah. it's a practice and, and we hope, I mean, I love doctors, um, but yeah. they not necessarily always will have the last say. No. Um, with that, would you give any advice in terms of um, assuming now you have a better doctor? Yes. With- that but what were the qualities that you would suggest other people to look for in um a doctor number look- one I would say go with your gut if it doesn't feel right find another doctor that's number one um and what makes it not feel right I'll get into that is you want someone who is going to listen to your story a little bit um consultation is usually 30 minutes to an hour 
Um, so the doctors that I had good experiences with were very compassionate with us as a couple, very calming to talk to, very, you know, understanding that, you know, hey, you know, I know that this is a little, you know, a little bit different of a route that you expected, but we're going to get you to point B one way or another. Um, I would say, you know, a lot of people going into it don't have any experience with it. So it's hard to know what to ask at first. Um, but I would say, you know, like try to do a little bit of research in advance. You know, you can reach out to me if, you know, you want to know what to ask, but, you know, just- and She really means that. And I mean it. I really mean it. I really mean it. <laughs> she but, really, really means it. Because people say it and they don't mean it, but I really mean it because um, of just the stories I've heard of people who get defeated by it. And it's, and it's mostly because of bad communication. Um, but it has to feel right for you. So if they're saying things that you don't agree with or you don't feel strongly about and they make you feel, um, they don't validate your feelings about that, I would say, number one, that's a sign, you know, walk away. Like you want someone who is going to be the authority when it comes to the science, but also treat you like a partner. You know, well, here are some other options that we could consider as well. What do you think about this? That to me is very important. It should be a back and forth dialogue, you know, maybe the first five, 10 minutes when they're explaining what IVF or, you know, there's all other treatments, what that is, that should be like you listening, but there should be some back and forth conversation as well. If you're not having that, then find another doctor, I would say. Absolutely. So it seems like you mentioned in, in answering this question a lot about feelings. So I want to bring up the mental health piece of it, you know, mentally, um, what type of support have you found? So I have found um, a lot of support. I'll say that um, a lot of it has been through familiar faces between family and friends. And the other half of it has been through complete strangers. And um, I say, I, I think that's important because you good know, strangers are the best. <laughs> good strangers are the best because <laughs> your family and friends can't get you through everything. You know, they just, they're, they can't, you know, um, I've had, you know, like friends, family, then I've been, I'm in a lot of Facebook groups that are tied to the clinic that I go to. Um, there's a lot of Facebook groups for fertility as it relates to black women, as it relates to like whatever clinic you're going to. Um, and I lurked a lot in those Facebook groups before I actually like spoke and said anything because I just wanted to see like what people were talking about. And in those Facebook groups, it was like, these are the people like on the day to day that I could be like, hey, I had my baseline appointment today and I had this many follicles and they want me to take this med. What does that mean? That's not something that I can ask, you know, my mom per se or a family member, someone who's not gone through that, you know? So you kind of need to find some, at least like one or two people you can relate to. And if you don't have that, cause I did have some friends that had gone through um, IVF as well. So that was the first place that I went. But um, if you don't have that, there are Facebook groups that are more of like a safe space where you can share that. I had that. Um, my faith was number number one. Um, that was, you know, very helpful for me. I had a therapist. I got a um, therapist that specialized in maternal health, um, postpartum, fertility. And she was amazing. I mean, she gave me homework on, you know, how are you going to deal with, with the feelings of this? Because one thing about infertility that I tell everybody, it's, it's a test you cannot study for. So if you're used to achieving in life and I'm used to achieving the goals that I set out for myself, I don't care how hard I studied for this test. It doesn't matter because it's not about how much you prepare and it is, but it's not, it's really up to, science and God, that's what I'll say. Um, you have to have some support. So in those support groups, just out of my own curiosity, so like I know, and you'll get into, you know, the advice that you would give a younger person. Are there people that are in these support groups, let's say that has tried IVF and just wasn't successful and they're past the point of being successful, but encouraging along the way, like have, what does that look like? Absolutely. I mean, that's the beauty of these groups is most of the people in those groups haven't had their happy ending because what tends tends to happen is, is that once people have their babies, they leave, you know, mm -hmm. they don't really have the need to be in the group anymore, or they'll pop back in and be like, you know, I just want to give you guys hope, keep you guys going because there are people in the groups who have been through it 10 times. No lie. 
10 times and have had all wow. kinds of surgeries for endometriosis, you know, have had like male factor and had all kinds of devastating things that would have, most people would have given up, but they didn't. Um, so the people that are in the groups are usually people who are still in the fight because the admins in the group, like a lot of the groups that I'm in, the admins, they're, they don't play. They're like, if there's rules, if you're saying negative things, discouraging, they'll kick you out. So that's great. Um, yeah. I would say, make sure you find a reputable group where you see that a lot. Um, is there a group that you like to share that? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I go to the fertility clinic we go to now is called CNY fertility. Um, and so if you look up CNY fertility clinic, they have over a dozen groups. There's the main group, CNY Fertility. I'm in the CNY Fertility 40 and up group. Um, I find that the most helpful for me because, you know, we're all talking like the exact same language in terms of age. Um, there's also a Black Women of CNY Fertility group. I'm in that one. Um, so that's very helpful in terms of like advocacy for us as Black women. Um, there's also another group called women of color, um, donor eggs, if that's, if that's something that anyone is ever, ever interested in, I lurk in those groups just to get information. Um, daughters of Hannah is another that daughters of Hannah. <laughs> <laughs> Hannah <laughs> means grace, by the way. So I'm sure that's what, yes, what it is. Yeah. It means favor of God and grace. Oh, that's, that's beautiful. So yeah. daughters of Hannah. Yeah. Daughters of grace. That's a dope yeah. name. <laughs> yeah. So those are just a few, but I would encourage you if you're, if you're looking to go to a specific clinic, look up that first, um, and then go from there. But yeah, CNY, I was in their groups before I was even a patient. So that's what really mm -hmm. made me solidify changing to that clinic. Okay. Okay. So I want to shift gears a little bit. We'll get back to more of the IVF stuff. However, I want to talk a little bit about your husband. You're a newlywed. Yeah. Through all of this, you just celebrated one year. Yes. Um, one year anniversary. Congratulations. Thank you. And you just moved from Atlanta to Florida. Yes. So, you know, huge transition and, you know, life-changing thing. And then you just switched doctors. Yeah. Um, and going through this process, and we'll talk later how many, what number of process that you're on this. Talk mm -hmm. to us about your husband. Um, let's talk about his support and how his mental has been impacted. And, and y'all, her husband is very supportive. He had a work <laughs> thing. Otherwise, he would be right in here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they are connected to the hip. We are. Um, and I love to see it. Um, how his mental has been during this process, what has, you know, he shared with you, you know, maybe pillow talk or not that maybe you can share and help other men or help other women that have husbands that are just struggling right now, you know, through this process. Yeah. So, um, my husband Talashi is like my number one cheerleader, you know, he's been the support system, the like unwavering support system from the beginning. Um, I think it took some time for him to wrap his head around IVF in the beginning, but it was because of our bad experience. It's not because he wasn't open to it. It was because of our bad experience, because once we had a better experience, you know, then he was just like, oh, okay. You know, cause like his, his, his thing with, with this is always like, am I going to be safe? It's always to protect me mm -hmm. and make sure I'm in good hands. He's not going to just like turn me over to anybody doctors or not. <laughs> um, but I will say like his positivity is part of what has kept me going round after round because, you know, I, I do read a lot of stories of women whose husbands give up on them. They don't want to continue anymore, um, you know, for reasons that are simply because maybe they don't fully understand it or, you know, they just have old school ways of thinking how babies need to be born. And this is like too much playing with, you know, science and God and all that kind of thing. But Talashi has been the support system for me to keep me going in this. Um, he's always the one to be hopeful when I'm not, you know, because this process is a, a lot of hurry up and wait. You're waiting for results all the time. And I'm always like, you know, oh my God, oh my God, I'm freaking out about it in the, in the way, you know, talking to like, you know, my, my support system about it. Well, what could this mean? And what could this mean? And he's not doing that. He's like happy, smiling, going on with his life. 
But that doesn't mean that he doesn't have emotions behind it because um, men in this situation, it's not happening to their bodies in the same way. So they don't feel the hormones and the emotions. They just kind of get the side effects of it from, from us going through it. Um, and we've talked a lot about the lack of support that Black men have in this. So it was always very important for me to check in with him. Like, hey, how are you feeling about this? You know, like, am I being crazy lady today? Or are you feeling overwhelmed? Do you need a break from it? You know, because it becomes the topic of conversation, like all while you're going through it. And other life is happening. You know, I'm working during the time he's working, you know, like family things are happening and it's not the only thing that's going on. Um, and so he and I did a Q and A video for my, it's not on my YouTube channel yet, but I'm editing it now. Um, <laughs> and he talked a lot about the male side of IVF um, and how to support your mate and also how, how he's feeling through it. And I really appreciate that about him because he finds a need. Every time he talks about it on his Instagram, someone reaches out to him. Um, he, he was out like at a day party one time and someone, you know, a friend of his came up to him and was like, hey man, we've been through this 10 times. 10 times, nobody's talking about that, you know? And imagine how much better it would be if men had the support amongst each other during that too, you know? Right. And especially the support of someone like your husband that is has right. been very supportive to you. So other men may not have that in their circle. Um, right. So just as women don't talk about it, men really don't talk about it. And they can see another side through the beauty of you and your husband, you know, being very yeah. transparent. So I think that is kudos, mm -hmm. guys. I cannot wait for you to upload the question and answering. Um, yes. Put it on our website as well. So yes. of such, you have a YouTube channel. So let's talk about yeah. your platform. You know, what is your YouTube channel about? Um, which we will also put a link on our website, Happy Mama, Happy Mini, um, to we want to follow your journey as well. And we be your, you can't be your number one because that's what's taken, but we'll definitely be a cheerleader yeah. <laughs> along this tribe, journey. Tribe <laughs> member is just fine. You don't have to be number one. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, why did you start a YouTube channel? You know, what has been the response? Like, give us the YouTube spiel. Okay. So initially it was just to document the journey um, because I had watched so many journeys when I was doing my research. That is how Talashi and I became comfortable with the idea of it and how it became more of like a normal thing. But one thing that we noticed was there was a lot of people of color missing in those stories. Um, and I found a couple and the couple that I, you know, a couple of people that I found, like, you know, I felt like, okay, I feel good about this now. You know, they're talking about their medication and how to advocate for themselves and all that. And, you know, infertility does, is, it knows no race. It, it, it's a disease, you know, like a lot of other diseases and it touches every community. Um, but I felt like there was a need for the conversation to not be so silent in our community because, as many people as I know that have gone through IVF, you know, a lot of people, like 90% of those people don't want to share it or talk about it. And how helpful would it be if, you know, like I was sitting at that table with my line sisters and four of us could have been going through it at that one time, but nobody would have known it if we didn't talk about it. Um, so that's why I started the channel was to document our process because I knew that I know that we'll have our baby one day and I thought it would be, I'm a very sentimental person. So I like videos and pictures. People are always like, you don't have to hire a photographer for everything. And I'm like, yes, I do. Yes, you but do. I want to see it. Well, I want to remember. Yes, you do. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> and it um, helps our memory. It helps our memory. It is. And then it becomes a living journal of, of you when you do have kids, because I would like for my channel to evolve, to not just be about infertility but when I am pregnant it's going to be about pregnancy it's going to be about you know early stages of having a newborn it's going to grow with our family um and because you know a lot of our family is kind of like remote from where we live it's a nice way for them to be able to kind of like pop in and see what's what's going on but yeah I started it just to document and the people that I connected with there that just commented on my videos I mean, it was people going through the exact same thing and it was mostly black women. You know, the majority of people that comment are in my age group, black women. And they're like, I'm so glad that you, you know, are talking about this because I'm going through the same thing. And, you know, you've given me so much comfort. And that, 
that makes me feel good. And so from that point, I was like, okay, I have a mission now of spreading the word and break, trying to break the silence around infertility because it doesn't have to be silence because so many people have to go through it. Um, so that's how I started the channel. That's why I started the channel. Um, and yeah, I'm looking forward to it continuing to grow. I mean, we've documented our first two rounds of IVF on there and I filmed all of like the first half of the, this last round. And so that's what I'm working on now is like editing all that footage to upload. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Um, so what, I know you said that you're doing this whole process. I guess my, my question is, well, you have a platform. You said now you are passionate about helping people and all that. What is next for that? Um, because I think you are extremely beautiful inside and out and you have a very calming voice to help women through this, mm -hmm. um, even husbands or boyfriends or whomever that may be experiencing this as well. Um, Cause sometimes the opposite sex, they may need to kind of hear it from someone else. Like right. what, does, what does the future of your platform look for, for you with your YouTube channel and just your brand about all of this? Yeah, I mean, ultimately I would like to get more into advocacy professionally. Um, and that could be anything from, you know, speaking engagements or just being the person that people know, oh, I can reach out to her and ask her a couple of questions. That alone would make me happy. That would be fulfilling for me. Um, I've always been like the resource in my friend group where if like, you know, people want to know how to do something, how to like, how do I change this on my phone or how do I work this on my camera? Like, I would like to be the resource um, for Black women to be able to feel like they have someone to talk to about, you know, like, how do I approach this, this, this journey and I'm just getting started? I don't even know where to start. Um, so yeah, I would like to get more into advocacy professionally. Um, and then from, go from there. I mean, I, I just made that post on Instagram I was telling you about, um, about this because I had not shared it on Instagram at all. You know, I was kind of like hinting around and, you know, throwing things up there here and there, but I had not come out and said, you know, that we have been having challenges on our own. Um, and that was a goal of mine for the first quarter of the year was to put that out there because Instagram is, it's kind of where like our age group lives, right? You know, and I felt like that was probably like the, the closest place to be able to reach people who probably needed it the most. Um, even just starting with my circle that I know, you know, mm -hmm. not just strangers. Um, and so that was the first step from, from that, um, you know, from that goal. And so, you know, from there, like I've gotten so much support and I've gotten so many people that have reached out to me that, you know, have, are going through it, have gone through it. And that makes me feel good. So if I can continue doing that, whether it's like tips on how to organize your medication or something like my content will probably change a little bit on Instagram. It's not going to be like all the fun and, you know, razzle dazzle as much anymore. I feel like I have a mission, you know, that God has put in my heart to help women to understand that they're not alone in this. I love that. I really, really love that. So now get back to sharing with us where you are in your IVF process. Is this one, two, three, four, five, ten? 10? Like, you know, tell us what that looks like and the time frame of it as well. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to start with the beginning and I'll, I'll get through that quickly because I think you'll better understand where we're at now. Um, so we've been through, this is our third attempt at IVF. We, um, we're going, we we're going to a clinic in Atlanta. We did our first two rounds there. Um, great doctor. He had all the compassion, very smart. I know a lot of people who have had success for him, but ultimately he just was not the right fit for us. Um, I felt kind of like a number there. And I felt like, um, especially with the second round. So the first round we were able to, so with, let me explain IVF really quick. So IVF, there's two parts of it. So there's the first part where you basically are growing more than one egg in your body. So you're kind of taking hormones, tricking your body into growing more than one follicle because normally we only release like one egg a month. That's, you know, our cycles. With IVF, you're taking medication to stimulate your body to produce more than one egg in a month. So the more eggs you get, the more opportunities you have for a baby because then those eggs are fertilized with sperm and those, you know, hopefully turn into embryos. And then the second part of that is that those embryos 
are transferred back into your body at the perfect time. Um, so we got to the first part of that with the first round. We got through egg retrieval. Uh, we had 11 eggs. Um, ultimately, four were, two were mature at retrieval, and then like four more matured in the lab. So we had six eggs to mature, um, and then five fertilized. So we had five embryos. And we did what is called genetic testing. So that's where they take like a small sample of the cells of the embryos to see if they're chromosomally normal or abnormal. Um, and in, in that process, you have to kind of push the embryos a couple of days to what they call a blastocyst. So that can happen at day five of growth, day six of growth, or day seven sometimes. Um, ultimately, they like to see that happen at day five. Um, and so because we did genetic testing, we only ended up with, we lost four of our five embryos in that waiting process. So we had one, I can't hear you, Nichelle. Okay. Sorry, because you had the test, is that what you're saying? That's why you lost them? Because we had to wait for them to grow um, to a certain like, like an age of like days. So they had to grow to day five. Okay. So sometimes in the lab, um, this to me is where the science and nature kind of fight because really the embryo wants to be back in, in its mother's body. It doesn't wanna be in a Petri dish in the lab trying to grow and multiply. It wants to be in its mom's body. So sometimes, you know, you lose along the way. You will, like some of them will die along the way. Um, and so we lost four of our five in waiting for them to get to that day five right. they would be able to get tested. So we had one um, and that one we sent off, we sent off those cells for testing and it came back abnormal. So we had nothing. Um, we walked away from that cycle with nothing. And, and that cost, correct? That cost. You still have to for, pay. For one set, for the first round, that's one thing. That's one thing. Yep, that's one price. Um, and regardless if it works or not, you still have to pay for that. Um, with genetic testing, like, it's, it's good and it's bad because there's a lot of controversy around it because some people feel like embryos can self-correct in the, in the uterus. Um, and some people are very adamant about, well, if it's not a normal embryo, I'm not going to transplant it because it won't, it won't stick. It won't turn into a pregnancy. Um, and I know people who have had normal embryos that have, that are their babies now. And I know people who did not test and have healthy kids now. And I know people that have transferred a normal embryo and it still did not result in a pregnancy. So that was devastating for me because like I was saying before, when I went back to like, this is a test you can't study for. I just, I didn't think that it wouldn't work. You know, mm -hmm. um, Flash and I both were very um, positive about it. And um, that was devastating for me. I was um, probably in a place of depression after that because I didn't really know what to do next. I didn't have like a backup plan. I didn't, you know, know what else to do. It was so much money. You're thinking about this is so much money. I don't know if we can afford to do this again. Um, and it was a little bit of a dark place for me at that time. Um, but I got out of it. <laughs> um, and what helped me to get out of it and move on was to just start researching, start looking for other places, looking for other opportunities. That's when I found CNY, a uh, fertility clinic. I didn't transfer it for then to that clinic, but after a couple of months, I had a plan for the next time around. And then our wedding was coming up. So that was like a nice distraction to kind of mm -hmm. take my mind off of things. So um, we had about six months between our first and second round. Okay. And now with the third round. Yeah. So the second round, we went back to the same doctor. Um, they, they, they messed up my medication. So it under suppressed me. And I had done all this work, like priming my body, all these probably taking 20 vitamins a day. Um, you and know, this is per the doctor's orders. Yeah. Per the doctor's process. orders. I For people that don't know, it's part of the process that you have. Yeah. Okay. There's something called, um, like you, it, the focus was focusing on my egg quality then, because he felt like it was my egg quality as to why things didn't really work out. Um, and so we were focusing on egg quality. That was like changing the, my diet to have more protein, you know, taking vitamins and supplements to increase your egg quality and improve it and make it better. Um, I was doing acupuncture at the time. I started doing acupuncture. So I was doing all of the things to make things better. And then the second time around, they kind of messed up my medications. 
And I felt like they didn't um, pay enough attention to what was going on with me close enough. So by the time that they kind of caught that that was happening, it was too late. So we didn't even get to the point of an egg retrieval. Um, and wow. what I'll say to everyone in that is, is just don't give up. Because if I had accepted that as my fate and my destiny, that, you know, oh, my body just didn't produce, then I would have you know, maybe had some self-doubt about myself or some self, this is where the shame comes in because as a woman, you know, you think at least I can have a baby, you know, if I can't do anything else, I can at least have a baby. And mm -hmm. if I had accepted that as my fate, but I had already had a plan. If that didn't work out, then we were going to switch clinics anyway. Um, and we had already had a consultation with my current doctor now, and it was like night and day. Um, my current clinic, um, and my current doctor, Dr. Robert Kiltz, he designed his clinic to be for people who, who want to go through infertility treatment, but he wanted to make it accessible for everyone. Um, and you had to go out of town for this, correct? I had to go out of town. Research. You did your yeah, research yeah. and you found. Mm -hmm. He's very active on social media. So I was able to watch. Um, he does lives on Sundays, like a fireside chat where you can ask any questions. It's on Instagram. It's on um, Facebook Live. And um, I just felt very connected to him because his focus is all about spirituality, spirituality and mindfulness before you even get to taking any pill or any shot. Um, he prayed with us on our first call and he told me, you know, like at your age, let's not push your embryos too far. Um, this time around, we're going to let them grow to day three and then we're going to freeze them. And we're not going to worry about the testing because he always says that he was, he's, he was probably an abnormal embryo himself and thank God someone gave him a chance. And I felt <laughs> very connected to that because me spiritually, I know that God has a plan and I want to give every embryo that we produce a chance. If it's not meant to be, my body will know what to do with that. If it is meant Absolutely. to be, then they'll stick around. And that makes me feel so much better than um, just discarding them or letting them die out in, you know, the lab or whatever. And, you know, I, I say this is my personal choice. Everyone makes their own choice with this and there's no right or wrong choice to make. But me personally, um, I just felt very strongly about giving my embryos a chance to grow in, in my body and not just discarding them before that. So yeah, so we just got back from New York in February, um, completed my, my um, egg retrieval. This time around, I was on a lot lower dosages of medication and my body did better this time. Congratulations. Um, thank you. So I'm happy to say that we have five embryos on ice now and they're just waiting to be transferred into mommy. So, that's um, so awesome. that's what we're preparing for now. So you talk a lot about your faith um, and we know you are a very faithful woman, um, but what are, do you have any fears? Yes, um, I do. I mean, of course you have the fear of it not working, um, but also feeling like I've never gone, gotten this far in the process. So being one step closer to motherhood, there's all a whole set of other worries that I have to worry that I'm thinking about now is you know, am I going to be a good mom? You know, like, is it going to hurt when I deliver a baby? Like, um, of, of course, all those things. But I think that this process has really prepared me well for this, because like I said, like the therapist that I had, I mean, she gave me a set of tools to be able to like, when you get in a corner, here's what you do. And here's how you mm -hmm. do it. So I feel mm -hmm. a lot better about it now. But yeah, of course, I have of course I have. I want to back up a little bit. I just want you to repeat where you are again with what you're proud to share with everyone where you are that you have not been yet. And this is your third round. Yes. You just got the news that. Yeah. Um, this is our third round, you know, third round. And, you know, one of the and it worked this time and it worked this time so far, we still have to make sure that. So the, so the next step is the embryo transfer. The embryo doesn't always stick. You know, like your body has to be the, at the perfect place at the perfect time. Everything has to align to, you know, get your body ready to receive that embryo and for that embryo to stick. And they transfer the embryo and then you wait two weeks and you take a pregnancy test. And that will confirm if you're pregnant. And then um, you don't graduate from your fertility clinic until you're about eight weeks pregnant. 
So there's a whole other round of shots that I'll have to take to prepare my body for that embryo transfer. Um, and then I'll have to continue some of those medications until I'm about 10 weeks pregnant. And then I'll graduate to my regular OBGYN. So women in that are going through IVF, a lot of us, them don't share their pregnancy announcements till they're like seven months pregnant, eight months, seven months, like and up because there's so much fear about like, you have to have this balance of being hopeful, but not too excited and attached at the same time. And that's really hard to do. It's that's really real. Yeah. Yeah. That's really real. So getting into the last part of, of this, you know, we know that there are no accidents, um, that God doesn't make mistakes and you are faithful. So I can say that God doesn't make mistakes and everything yes. is truly, you know, working together for, um, a specific point in time. Mm -hmm. you know it it may be in your journey of you and your husband's journey and you know moving and God knew that you were going to know that you were going to move to Florida yes <laughs> so it could be the timing of how he you know has things in our lives and for you know it to arrive when it's supposed to arrive mm -hmm. um and I, I just wanted to note that and 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 with that being said what would you tell your 21 year old self? Um, that's a really good point you bring up because that's something that I would tell my 21 year old self. I would first say, um, you know, just slow down and think about, think about what you ultimately want in life. Maybe you don't have it right now, but you know, if I had known about egg freezing or things like that back then, um, I would have frozen my eggs at 25 by 25 you know, just to preserve it and be like, hey, you want to travel the world until you're 35. Let's freeze these eggs and give ourselves a little insurance policy and, you know, live the rest of my life. I would, I would say that. Um, I would also encourage my 21 year old self to never be afraid to stick up for yourself and advocate for mm -hmm. yourself, no matter what anybody says. It can be the most smartest doctor in the world. If it does not sit well with you, then move on. You know, there's, there's, don't let anyone shut you up. You know, if you feel strongly about something, then persevere and keep going forward with that. Um, timing as well. You know, I'm a Virgo <laughs> like you. And yes, we're Virgo sisters. You understand how much we like our planners and organizers. There are some things in life that you just cannot plan for. Cannot. You cannot. And that was like a big thing in therapy that we worked on was just letting go of the control because this is, you know, when you are too tight about, you know, what the outcome should be and when it should be and blah, 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 blah. It will never happen that way. And you made yourself so upset, you know, because of that, not because of so much of the outcome, but just because of that. Um, so I would just also say to my 21 year old self to just let go a little bit, go with the flow. Yeah. And have faith that things will work out. If you put it out there in the universe, because I've said it, you know, to myself, I've writ written, it written it down, you know, I will be a mother one way or another, you know, I am open-minded. I am open to everything all the way up to adoption. So I will be a mom one day. And if, you know, I've put that in the universe and, you know, God has told me that it will be so. So just let go and yes. trust. It will be so. Yeah. And, and even with that, you know, talking about how and when you will become a mom and other people, you know, rethinking or reshaping the way yeah. that we talk about having babies, you know, what that conversation, you know, look like, because it's not always easy for everybody. Yeah. And, you know, really hard for more people than yeah. really probably could, could think, you know, how can people better support mm -hmm. people that are in your shoes, but they don't know, you know, they just, you don't know sometimes what you don't know. Yeah. Um, what, do you have any advice or, you know, having challenging concerns about people doing that and in, in any advice, you know, for them not to, or. Yeah. I mean, I, I think now with, you know, everything that's going on that, you know, now we are educating ourselves more about infertility. Don't ask people, when are you going to have a baby? Just, it, it's not a question to ask anymore because, you know, like the, the person standing next to you smiling could have just gone through a miscarriage last night and they are putting on face to not fall apart in this moment at this meeting or wherever it is, you know, just because someone has just gotten engaged or just gotten married, 
that does not mean you have the right to ask them when they're having a baby. Because for one, everybody doesn't want to have a baby. And that is okay. Everyone doesn't want to get married. And that is okay. You know, um, I just think that we need to normalize, like, minding our business when it comes to that, unless the information is volunteered and trying to have like more, listen more to what people are saying. If they haven't shared with you that they, you know, are interested in having kids or being a mom one day, then you probably shouldn't ask that question. Or, you know, there's secondary infertility. There are people that have have a baby and they have a hard time with the second baby. And that's just as devastating as not being able to have, you know, the first child. So I just think, um, that is one thing. And then also, if you do meet someone that is going through infertility treatment um, or IVF, there is something called like, like extreme optimism that can be just as harmful as mm. like negativity and, pessimi and pessimism, pes being pessimistic. And so, yeah, we want to hear like, you know, God has you, this is going to be good, <laughs> but don't, but sometimes that can be too much where people are like, well, if you just stop stressing, then you'll get pregnant. If you go right. on this trip or if, if you, you know, if you take, if have you tracked your ovulation, just don't make any suggestions unless people are asking. And that's what I try to say is just be more sensitive to listening to people and just like Listen. learning where people are, you know, that I think that is just a general statement that goes with everything. Yeah. Like we got to meet people where they are and understand yeah. that in different phases and seasons of our lives, we're in different places. Yeah. Absolutely. You have to meet those people where they are. Mm -hmm. And I, I would like for you to look through the chat and see if there's anything that you want to address. Um, and while you look through that, um, to round it out, I just, I would like to add, you know, yes, I am a mom and, and, you know, we all have our stories and I thank God that, um, I didn't listen to the doctors either. Um, yeah. with that, for people that are not mothers, um, I, I just think that, you don't have to carry a child um, to be, um, mm -mm. you know, giving birth and, you know, being pregnant doesn't make you a mother. Yeah, that's true. And, that's and true. even the other half of that, it doesn't make a father a father being able to help a woman, you know, produce a child. Um, right. Having that natural, um, natural, oh, excuse me, that just, it just makes me sad. <laughs> Times, but just having that natural maternal instinct and that yeah. heartfelt, you know, beat about yourself and to love and to nurture a child through life, like yes. their life, you know, yeah. at 18, you get out my house, like their whole life. Like I couldn't imagine if my parents cut me off at 18, yeah. cut me off in a financial type of way, but cut me off like with love, yeah. and support, like, oh my God, where would I be today? Yeah. Um, and what would I be teaching my children and how could I be so supportive to other people? So I just think that makes you a mother and yes. I've known you for 15 years and you are a mother, you are yes. a mother and you will be the mother that you want to be one day, but you are already a mother. You are yes. the ultimate aunt to your entire family with the kids. I see it. They love you. Like God is preparing you for your moment, whichever that moment may be. And, yeah. you know, we just want to, from my nonprofit, thank God in advance, you know, for his divine timing, because that's what it's going to be for your journey in becoming a happy mama and yeah. allowing peace along your journey and having a supportive partner because not mm -hmm. everyone has that. So you are super blessed. You have our support. Um, thank you. you know, specifically what Happy Mama, Happy Mini can do to support you. And, and I say this and I mean it because sometimes people look at support like, well, I want to do this for that person. Well, you may not need that type of support. So yeah. as we get older, we have to be very specific with what that support looks like for us. And we need from people. Yeah, that's true. And on the other end of that, receive it and help people how they need to be helped. Not just how you feel like helping. That's not really helping people. Right. That's convenient for you. Right. Well, when you have people that say that they're in your corner and they want to support you, be very specific on how they can support you. Don't be afraid of that because yeah. those people that really want to support you, they're going to. Yeah, that's true. That's absolutely true. That's a good point you make. And I'm really glad that you said that about so many different ways to become mothers um, because there is a need for more women of color to become donors or donor eggs. There is a huge gap missing of uh, women of color 
that will donate their eggs. And I have seen the most beautiful stories of women who have become mothers that way and would not have been mothers otherwise. Um, there's embryo adoption for someone who can't use their eggs or their partner's sperm. And it's much cheaper than traditional adoption. And you still get the, the benefit of being able to be pregnant during that time. So there are so many ways. And that's why I'm saying this conversation is important because a lot of people are closed-minded and they give up on their journeys to parenthood completely because maybe of one bad experience or a couple of times of things not working. Um, and you have to get very clear with yourself about what your end goal is. And if that is to be a parent, there are ways that it can happen. So, yes. Do you have any final words or those your final words or? Yeah, I think, I think that's my final words. Um, thank you again to everyone watching. You guys have all been such a great support system to me and Talashi through this. And even just in me getting the confidence to talk about this and post about this, you know, like, thank you for being my cheerleaders. I love all of you. Thank you so much. And yes. And we look stuff. forward to, oh, of course, we look forward to continue to support you and, you know, real question. So you don't have to answer it today, but as you think yes. through, please let me know how, you know, you want to be supported and what that looks like. Okay. I, I promise you, I will. Yes. And you have such a huge support system and I'm very happy that you have that. Um, and thank you again for giving me the opportunity to allow you to share your platform with, with happy mamas and happy minis, you know, and happy minis on their journey to becoming a happy mama. Yes. And this could not be more special for me, my sister, because this is my very first interview and you know, I love you so much and feel so comfortable doing this. I was nervous, but not too, ba too bad because it was you. So thank you so much. Well, I wore pink for you. <laughs> we have these jokes all the time. <laughs> You're that pink, girl. <laughs> thank you, guys. Um, we're going to make sure that this is um, uploaded and she will have it on her YouTube and I will have it on mine for those that, you know, found something and you wanted to share with a friend, a family member or your husband, boyfriend or whatever the case may be. Um, again, we appreciate you for being so transparent and truly God has you and, and we do as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye.